There we go. All right, welcome everyone. This is our science of pollinators. I will go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so let's talk pollinators today because it is pollinator week nationally and in Nebraska, we're celebrating this. Um, so if you have questions, like I mentioned, that's great. And I hope you put comments and stuff in the chat. Uh, just remember to keep it on topic and do be nice to everybody. If not, we do have the right to remove you, which I'm sure we won't have a problem today. I also wanna point out to people that I'm by no means a pollinator expert or any expert in any of these science of that I do. I do a lot of research and a lot of searching for information Information. So if you have questions or if you have comments, please feel free to put them in the chat. If I can't answer them, I'll find someone that can and I will get back to you. So I really love science and I like doing these science ofs, um, but I'm, I don't know everything and I don't want to pretend to know everything. So um, please have questions and please please feel free to put them in the chat. So um, we're going to go ahead and start talking really quickly, just what is pollination? I'm sure all of us kind of have an idea, and I'm sure some of us are very versed in pollination, but let's go ahead and uh, look at this in a little bit more in depth. So uh, like I mentioned, it is pollinator week. So that's why we're having a specific science of this week all about pollinators. So all right. So when we talk about pollination, I'm sure all of us have an idea of what it is. It is the transfer of pollen basically from one flower to another flower. So that's kind of the simplest form that I can show you. It's very important because if we don't have pollination, we don't have flowers, we don't have food, we don't have food for all these animals that are pollinators. So it's kind of a big cycle. Um, humans rely on pollination more than we want to admit or more than we maybe know. Uh, so it's very important, critical um, reproductive cycle of a lot of these flowering plants. So, so basically the goal of every living organism, no matter what it is, is to pass on their genes and to create offspring for the next generation. So plants are no different, um, no different than people or no different than uh, snakes, no different than birds. Uh, so they, they want to pass off their genes, but they have a little more difficult time doing that than um, other types of animals. Um, but basically it's transferring pollen grains from the male anther, what is called the anther of a flower, to the flower the female stigma. So transferring that pollen from one to another flower in the hopes that they will produce offspring in a new plant in the hopes of making those um, seeds for different types of plants. Um, so seeds, like we uh, maybe know, they contain all the information of a plant. So how tall it's going to be, what color it's going to be, when the bloom time is going to be. Um, so those are all that genetic information in that seed. So they're very critical to move on to that next generation. And then the flowers are then the tools that they use to kind of make those seeds. So the flowers are important just as much as the seeds are important. There we go. All right, so then the seeds can then only be produced when pollen is transferred between those flowers of the same species. So there are some species that can hybridize with each other, um, but mostly it's it's specific um, pollen that goes to specific types of plants, just like specific animals can um, uh, reproduce with each other and create a same species of the species that they are. So um, even though we do know it happens, but it's it's rare and it doesn't always end well and the genetic information isn't always great when that does happen. So um, flowers need to pollinate, but they can't necessarily do it on their own. So they rely on a vector. So there's a lot of different ways that they can pollinate. It's not always an animal. It could be wind. It could be water. It could be people. Um, it could be uh, lots of different ways, but basically it needs a little bit of help. Um, and so there's a lot of animals, there's a lot of different ways, but they just need to get that pollen to another place. Um, so the animals that do help with this are called pollinators, which I'm sure a lot of us know. Um, so we're going to be talking a little bit about the different types of pollinators today as well. All right, so pollination, uh, we, we see it as a critical and necessary uh, strategy that a lot of animals do but they're not really knowing that they're doing it. It's kind of an accident. So they're actually looking for protein and other nutrition that they get from those flowers. And then pollination is kind of just the after effect, or it's a it's a great thing that, that happens while they're doing it, but it's not necessarily their main goal. So there's not a bee or a butterfly out there that's like, I'm gonna go pollinate today. They're like, I gotta go get some food and this dust is getting all over me. And so they go to another flower and that dust falls off and then they transfer that information to another flower. So it's not necessarily a conscious thing that these animals are doing. Um, a lot of us, I'm sure, have picked a dandelion before and we've blown the seeds out 
Um, a lot of that is fun. Um, sometimes it's cool to see the seeds, but a lot of us don't pick it and go, okay, I'm going to go pollinate right now. So again, it's just kind of a thing that happens, um, but it's not necessarily that animal's main goal in their life. They're just trying to get their food. They're just trying to survive. So um, when an animal visits um, another flower for the same reason, again, that pollen falls off and it goes onto the flower stigma and that can result in successful pollination. Not always does it do that, um, but most of the time it will um, be a successful pollination. All right, so if some of you are like, I kind of don't remember where the stigma is, I don't really remember what you're talking about, here's the parts of a flower. So the stigma is right here. Um, the anthers are right here. So um, a lily is a great example of this, just because I think that's kind of what this one is. Um, but if you see those little yellow pieces, so there's tiny little bits of dust or pollen in there. Um, so the flower, so the animal is coming in, it's grabbing the nectar or the, the sugary stuff in there, it's getting all that stuff or that dust on it, and then it goes to another flower and it transfers it to there. So um, from the male anther of the flower to the female stigma. So when they transfer that in the hopes of then a successful pollination. So this is kind of what we're talking about when I say stigma versus the petal versus the anthers. This is what we're looking at. All right, so why is pollination important? We know it's important because those animals are getting their necessary food, but they're also getting um, the nutrition that they need, but they're also getting those dusts of pollen on there. Um, so that really helps. So um, pollen looks insignificant. It makes a lot of us sneeze. It's kind of annoying sometimes, but it's very, in, it's great because that's how the reproductive cycle carries on. It's that vital link between it. Um, so without pollinators, basically the human human race would cease to exist. So thank a pollinator. Um, if you like to eat, about one in three bites of food comes from a pollinator. So again, thank a pollinator. Um, basically, the Earth's terrestrial ecosystem would not survive without pollinators. So again, they're not doing it on purpose, but we really appreciate what they're doing. So um, when we talk about all the crops that we have, um, there's a lot of ways that humans have been involved in getting uh, plants to reproduce without pollinators. But of those 1,400-ish crop plants out there in the world, about 80% of them require pollination by an animal. So there's other ways, like I mentioned, there's water and there's wind that's not necessarily as um, frequent as a pollinator. So mostly it's those animals. Um, and studies have shown that if humans kind of are the ones that interfere and try to pollinate those other animals without, or those other plants without those animals, um, studies kind of show that if bees, for instance, the best pollinator out there, um, the flowers that are pollinated by bees, they actually result in larger and more flavorful fruits and also higher crop yield. So it's this natural cycle of things that do well without humans. We don't need us. Um, they're doing well on their own and they had been doing well for long periods of time, um, but it, show, it still shows that they produce better yields, they produce higher quality of fruits, and then it's also more flavorful as well. Um, the pollination, um, annually, um, basically just here in the United States, is around $10 billion. So um, the pollination of those agricultural crops um, usually is about $10 billion, with a B, um, billion dollars annually. When we look at globally how much money the pollination industry has, we're looking at $3 trillion. So um, pollination is quite important. All right, so when we talk about um, pollination, it's not just a, a simple thing as like a bee going in, getting some dust and then transferring it to another flower. There's actually a strategy. So different flowers have different adaptations and they have different strategies that allow certain pollinators to pollinate certain plants. So it's not like a bee visits any kind of plant that it wants. It knows um, just instinctually, it knows it can only visit certain things. So um, we're gonna talk a little bit now about those strategies that those plants and those animals have for using and completing pollination. So when we talk about um, adaptations that plants have, so not all plants look the same. They are different sizes. They have different colors. They grow in different areas. Some of them have different shapes of petals. It's all for a reason. It's all for certain pollinators. And it's like a big billboard sign saying, I need these pollinators to come to me because I have these certain things. So um, when we talk about the traits that flowers have um, to try to get certain pollinators to most efficiently pollinate their plants, we 
call those pollinator syndromes. Um, it kind of sounds like something scary or something that's wrong with the plant, um, but it's a syndrome because it's a pollinator specifically can go to a certain plant and that's vice versa. That plant specifically needs a certain type of pollinator. Um, so flowering plants over time have co-evolved with their pollinator over millions and millions of years to produce um, this diversity of the floral strategy. So we're talking about the color, we're talking about the smell, we're talking about the location, um, the types of petals that they have. All these different things are very critical for certain pollinators to come. And so um, it's a really intimate association with that um, creature and with that plant. So some of these, there's two basically pollination methods when we break it down. One of them is um, abiotic. So it is pollination without the involvement of organisms. So this would be something like wind or water. Um, and then there's pollination that is done by animals and we call that a biotic. Um, when we talk about how many different types use what strategy, about 80% of all plants that are pollinated are by animals. So animals are very critical. Um, and then the remaining about 20% there is pollinated by about 98% of that is wind and then 2% is water. So there's not a lot of plants that are pollinated by water. Um, there's about 20% of them that are pollinated by wind and then the 80% of them are with an animal. So animals and pollinators are very important. All right, so what about those that are wind pollinated? So if anyone has ever seen one of these things, they're called a cat. Kin. Um, they're kind of like these upright kind of droopy flowers. They're usually small, they're grouped together, um, and they produce a really large amounts of pollen, and it's very light pollen. So these are plants that use wind to carry their pollen, to hopefully to another plant, in the hopes that they will reproduce together and make a new seed into a new flower. So um, plants that use wind um, for pollination, they usually have flowers that appear early in the spring, um, way before the leaves are emerging. So so this is because they do not want the leaves interfering with the pollen getting to the other seed. So over time, they have learned that they need to start developing their um, catkins early so that the wind can move that pollen to the another catkin in another part of the, the city or another part of the area and start making a new seed, which then develops into a new flower or a new tree or something like that. So um, a lot of these um, plants are really small, they're smooth, and that pollen's really lightweight because the wind has to carry it. And this is a lot different from something that's pollinated, for instance, like a bee or a butterfly or even the water. All right, so what about water? There is about 2% of all plants that are water pollinated. It doesn't happen very often, but um, the ones that do are very specific. So there's a very small amount of aquatic plants. Um, that's usually the ones that are pollinated by water, um, but a lot of pollen will float on the surface um, and then it drifts basically in contact with the flower. So it doesn't sound very efficient, but it is for certain types of plants. And then most aquatic plants are insect pollinated actually, not a lot of them are water pollinated, um, but basically the flowers emerge above the water in the air. So a great example is like um, an American lotus plant, which is the plant that I have here. It comes up, up above the water, the bees or whoever will visit it and move on to different things. But there are a lot of plants that actually release that pollen into the water in the hopes that it will drift into another plant and again, make a new seed into a new flower. So um, these plants are usually directly put their pollen in the water. Um, and this is called hydrophily. It's very rare, but it does happen. And then many of the water plants actually that have been pollinated by water, at least in the US, are actually ones that are invasive. So if you see one, there is a good chance that it's actually an invasive plant. All right, so now we're talking about animals. So over time, animals have evolved many methods for pollinating and attracting those pollinators. So it's not just a simple like, I'm a flower, you're a bee let's pollinate. It's very different. Um, so it's different types of animals and different types of flowers come and work well together or more efficiently together. Um, and then in the same thing, pollinators have evolved a lot of cool structures and behaviors to help out those plants in that pollination. So again, they're not doing it to pollinate. They're basically just trying to get the nectar. And in the process of getting that nectar or those nutritional values from the plant, they just happen to pollinate at the same time. 
Um, so the plants and the pollination that goes with an animal is usually very sticky. So this is very different than something that is wind pollinated. If it's heavy and it's sticky, it's not going to get carried by the wind. But that heavy, sticky pollen works very well to a fly or a beetle or a wasp or something like that. So um, a lot of these plants have actually done some visual cues or they have certain smells or they have a mimicry or something that they will do to get those animals to come to them. Um, a great example of a specific structure that has evolved over time. And even though we don't have bat pollinators in Nebraska, um, bats have those specialized noses and those specialized tongues to reaching into all those nectar filled flowers. And um, then they get all the dust and stuff, their pollen on their face. Um, those those are a great structure and it's a great example. Even though bats in Nebraska, they're all insectivores, so we don't have um, bats that pollinate in Nebraska. Most likely they're going to be in places like South America or even really, really southern United States. We just don't have the pollinating bats in Nebraska. All right. So what are we talking about these visual cues? So we see a flower um, and it has to attract a pollinator. So it could mean the petals, it could be the size. There's something called nectar guides, which we do not see. Um, I'll show you a picture of here of what like a bee would see um, versus what we see as a human. Um, the shape of the flower is very important, the size of the flower. Um, animals know which ones they're most likely to fit in or um, get the best types of uh, nutritional value from. So over time, they've just kind of co-evolved to each other. All right. So when I talk about nectar guides, it's basically if you guys have ever been on a plane, there's those people with those orange cones and they kind of back up the plane. They're showing you, hey, it's right over here. Well, the flower is doing the exact same thing to a lot of bees and butterflies, wasps, flies, that kind of stuff. Um, so in the top pictures are what people would see in the daylight. Um, the other pictures are what bees will see or flowers would see, um, depending on um, the, the lighting and depending on a lot of it's like UV light. So bees will see differently than people. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Um, so when we talk about this, um, the top part is what we see, and then the bottom part is what the, the bees see. So the second picture, that yellow flower, if you look down, you see that there's these darker marks um, in the center of the flower. That's letting the bees know that, hey, here's where the nectar is. Come down to here and get it. Um, this is a, There's better examples out there. Um, so if you Google search um, nectar guides, some of them, if you hold them under UV light, there's like bright yellow or bright purple stripes on the plants. They're basically helping the bees or the whoever the butterflies say, hey, here's where all the nectar is. Please come down right here and get it. So that's something that helps. Um, and there's also this huge list um, you can find on Pollinator Partnership, or there's a couple different places on Google you can find them. Um, but it basically tells you all the things and how those plants are pollinated um, and basically what those animals are looking for. So for instance, butterflies, they like bright colored flowers, red, purple, yellow, um, but things like moths, they're out at night, they don't really need to see bright colored flowers. They like pale colored flowers, like a morning glory. Um, so there's a lot of things like nectar guides. There's odors, like flies love putrid or kind of rotting smelling flowers. We've all smelled some of those before. But then there's butterflies like fresh or bees sometimes really like really um, minty flavored or minty smelling things. So it all is important because of that pollinator. So the flowers, again, have over time co-evolved with those pollinators to get the best and most efficient pollinator come to their flower. All right, same thing. So bees and bats and beetles are going to be a little bit different. Um, birds, for example, they don't really need a ton of pollen. They eat other things, but they like modest producing ones. But they really need something that looks like a funnel. Um, a bird, like a hummingbird, has a very long beak, it will stick its tongue into there, get the nectar way down deep in there. Well, that's not really going to work for an ant because they're so small, they could get stuck in there. So there's a lot of different types of um, characteristics of those flowers that work better with different types of animals. Well, sorry. 
And then one other thing that um, plants have over time done is to kind of reduce the competition because your neighbor and me are both trying to get pollinated at the same time. Well, what if I pollinate in the morning? What if you pollinate at night? What if you pollinate in the spring? What if I pollinate in the fall? So over time, they've kind of um, spread out their growing seasons or their flowering times. Not only does this reduce competition for them to get pollinated and to make new flowers, but it also helps with different types of animals and having food all year long. So if you are really interested and starting a pollinator garden or pollinator friendly space at your house. Um, one of the things that we always recommend people to do is get flowering plants that bloom at different times of the year. So there's some that bloom in the fall and that's a great source of food for the, um, the bees, let's say, or there's certain plants that are really spring um, oriented. Dandelions are actually really good sources of food, um, early sources of food for things like butterflies and bees and ants and beetles. Um, they're in the spring, but then pollinate or make something else in the fall that way um, there's lots of different types of flowers and there's lots of different types of food for those pollinators as well. One of the things we're also seeing is that um, over time, the pollinators um, basically come out the same time that the uh, plants are also flowering. Well, we found that flowers are blooming a little earlier and there's no one around to pollinate them. So they die off before the bees are coming out and awaking um, and then they're running out of food. So there's a lot of different things. I think over time in the United States, I want to say it's an average of like 30 days or something, which doesn't sound like a lot, but there's a whole cycle time that we're missing those animals to get pollinated and to pollinate those flowers. All right, so that was a lot of information about the pollinators and the strategies that they use. So let's take a look and see who our pollinators are. So where do they look like? What are they? Um, are these all different types of animals? So um, ants, goodness, ants are probably like the least great efficient pollinators, but they still do pollinate some flowers. Um, they like certain things. So Ants are social insects. They usually live in colonies and they have lots of different people or lots of different ants that live in those colonies and they love nectar. However, they really need um, small, low growing flowers. So they don't have wings. So they need something that they can crawl into. So um, they're more likely to just to take the nectar, but they're not very good at effectively cross pollinating flowers. They just don't get a ton of pollen that sticks to them. They're most likely small. They're gonna get in there. They're gonna eat the nectar and they're gonna leave. And then when they go to another plant, there could be some pollen that's stuck to them, but they're not the most amazing pollinators out there. A lot of research has actually discovered that ants are not important pollinators, even though they visit different flowers and they could have some pollen grains that attach to them and then they detach them. Um, a lot of them actually secrete this larva or this um, mucus that acts as a uh, antibiotic. So this secretion basically um, protects the ants from bacterial and fungal infections. But unfortunately for the flowers um, that are visited by these ants that make this mucus, it kills a lot of the pollen grains and then it doesn't do well for the flowers. So even though it acts like a natural antibiotic for the ant, it's not great for the pollen. So um, they're not one of the best pollinators out there. There's others that are better, but they do pollinate some. Um, an ant is most likely going to visit a flower that's low growing um, because they, they don't fly. They have small, really inconspicuous flowers. And then the flowers that they do visit are very close to the stem. So they're going to get lost. They're small. They're going to drown in the pollen. Um, so they have to have something very little. All right, birds are very important pollinators. Um, Nebraska is maybe not one of the, the hot spots for pollinating birds, but we do have hummingbirds. There's also things like honey creepers or honey eaters out there too that have those really long beaks. Um, but we do have the ruby-throated hummingbird. It's the native hummingbird that's found in Nebraska. Um, over time or globally, there's about 2,000 birds that feed on the nectar, um, but they also will eat the insects and the spiders that are associated associated with those nectar bearing flowers. So they're kind of um, looking for the nectar, they're pollinating, but they're also there for things like the spiders and the insects. So um, in the US, we're looking at hummingbirds. That is our key US um, pollinator of all those wildflowers, but also there's parrots, there's honey creepers, there's honey eaters. Um, a lot of these birds are gonna be in tropical areas just because there's more different types of flowers that fit the, their pollination style.
So a uh, flower that a bird is most likely to visit, it's going to be tubular. So they need something that looks like a straw or a tube because they have that long beak. So they stick it in there and then they stick their tongue out to grab that nectar inside. They need to have a funnel shape or a cup shape. They really need a strong support because that bird may need to perch on there. Not necessarily a hummingbird, they hover but different types of animals may perch and eat that nectar later. They also like really brightly colored flowers, so red, yellow, orange color, and birds don't have a sense of smell, so they don't really care if the flower smells or not. Um, they're also not gonna be nocturnal, so the flower needs to be open during the daytime. And then they really like a lot of nectar, so they have to reach down in there. Um, but the flowers that they do like, for instance, a hibiscus is a good example. Um, they're modest pollen producers. They're mostly designed to dust the bird bird's head. And then when the bird visits another flower, again, it touches the other part of that anther and gets the pollen in there. But they're not these huge producing pollen um, uh, flowers like something like a bee would visit. All right. So again, in Nebraska, we do not have bats that are pollinators. All the bats we have in Nebraska, all 13 species, they are um, insectivores. So they eat insects. They do not eat fruit or anything like that. We don't have fruit in Nebraska. Um, so they're important part pollinators in places like tropical and those desert climates. But again, not Nebraska. There's two really common species that a lot of people have probably heard of, um, the lesser long-nosed bat and then the Mexican long-nosed bat. These are the ones that have those really long um, kind of tubular like noses that they can stick into the flowers, grab the nectar, and then get dusted with pollen in the process. Um, but bats, again, just like those hummingbirds, they feed on the insects around the flowers. So they're there for the nectar, they're there for the fruit, but a lot of them will also eat both the nectar fruit and the insects around them. And then there's over 300 species of fruit that depend on bats for pollination. So if you like mangoes, if you like bananas, if you like guavas, you can thank a bat because they are the ones that pollinate that stuff. Um, when we talk about bats also, we also need to remember that they have all those cool structures in their face that they will eat to the fruits. They will eat um, the insects around there as well. Um, also, if you know um, the agave plant, the agave makes tequila, very important for a lot of cultures and a lot of people, and we can thank the bats for that as well because they are the ones that pollinate the agave plant. All right, so what's a flower look like that a bat's going to visit? So they're usually open at night because these are nocturnal animals. They're coming out at nighttime, so it doesn't make sense for the flower to open during the daytime. They're very large, um, so bats are way bigger than something like an ant or a beetle. So they need a bigger space to eat and to get that nectar out of. Um, bats don't really care if they're colorful, so pale or white in color. They have to smell really good, kind of like that fermenting or fruit-like odor. And then there's a copious dilute nectar in there. So lots of nectar. It has to make sense and be efficient for that bat to go there and drink that nectar. So there needs to be a lot of nectar producing in those flowers. All right. Butterflies. So butterflies are really good at pollinating. I'm sure a lot of us have seen butterflies on flowers before. These guys are the ones that come out during the daytime. Moths kind of take over the night shift, um, but butterflies are active during the day. They visit a ton of different types of flowers, um, but they're not really as efficient at pollinating as bees are. So they do move a lot of pollen, but bees are like the, the best pollinators out there. So everything else is kind of second tier to a bee. Um, but these guys, since they have really long legs, they don't get dusted by a lot of that pollen like bees do. So they don't pick up a lot when they move from flower to flower. Their bodies just really aren't um, specialized to carry that stuff. Bees have those pollen baskets kind of behind their legs. Butterflies just don't have that. So they're not as efficient at pollinating as a thing like a bee. Um, but they use their proboscis so that kind of straw-like thing that they have on their face. It rolls up and that's what they use to probe for the nectar. They have their taste buds on their feet. So when they land on something, they know if they want to eat it or not. Um, but that flavor, they really like those clustered flowers together. They provide a great landing pad. So cone flowers are great. Um, if you've ever seen the um, flowers in the fall, um, they really like those types of flowers as well. Um, 
totally blanking on the name. It's a purple flower we have it in our lawn and I can't think of what it's called, but um, they really like those types of flowers. Salvia, that's it. They like salvia a lot because it's clustered together. So they don't have to go here and then travel a long way to get over here, to go over here. There's a lot of flowers grouped together for them. So it makes it a lot easier. So they really rely on that sense of smell because they do not have good vision. All right, so what's a flower look like that a butterfly is going to visit? Like I mentioned, they're going to be clustered because they like those landing platforms that like very brightly colored plants. So yellow, orange, red, um, they open during the day. They produce a lot of nectar, but it's really deeply hidden because they use that proboscis or that tongue, that straw to get that nectar out of there. There's also nectar guides. So what people see, what bees see, what butterflies see are very different because again, certain flowers want certain types of pollinators to come visit them. So what we see, it may be very different than what a butterfly sees and be very different than what a bee sees. So um, those nectar guides are gonna be showing them again where that pollen and where that nectar is. And they also are usually gonna be clusters of smaller flowers, um, but things like goldenrod, spirea, those are great butterfly flowers. All right, so bees. Bees are amazing pollinators. We've talked about this. They're, they're low growing, they're smaller, they have pollen baskets on them. Um, these guys have over time, um, they're very an ancient species and they've evolved over time with a lot of different plants. So these guys um, visit a lot of flowers to collect that pollen and nectar for food and themselves and their young. When we talk about pollinators, um, we have to remember that the European honeybee is not a native species. It's not from the United States, it's from Europe. Um, it was brought over because they're very good at pollinating. There is no denying that. But when we talk about native flowers and native pollination, it's the things like the other types of bees. So things like bumblebees, things like leaf cutter bees, um, sweat bees, all of those things. Those are the ones we really need to watch out for and really need to um, cater to and pollinate and plant for because they're the ones that have over time evolved into um, pollinating and producing the native types of flowers. So the European honeybee has over time been flexible with a lot of things, but my observation is they're basically cows with wings. So they are domesticated species. They're something that was brought over here. They're not native. They're doing okay. Um, it's really the things like our bumblebees and our native bees that we need to watch out for. And they're the ones that are in trouble because of all the loss of the habitats and the, the different diseases and stuff like that. So it's really the native bees that we're worried about. But they have a very high energy need, so they have to go to a lot of different flowers, and they have to meet that need simply for their survival. So when they go to different types of plants, they're really trying to get the nectar and the nutritional value out of that. They're not really, again, their main goal is not to pollinate, it's just to get that food. They just do it in the process. Um, but bees need a lot of resources, like pollen and nectar, and they actually can go to a variety of flowers. All right, so what's a flower look like that a bee is going to visit? Um, it's full of nectar. It has to be efficient for them to come to it and get something out of it. They're usually brightly colored. A lot of the times you're going to see them on a blue or a yellow flower, or sometimes there's a mixture of these. Um, salvia, like I mentioned, um, we have them by our mailbox, and I look out there every day, and there's always tons of bees out there. But they're sweetly aromatic or sometimes it's kind of a minty fragrance they found that bees really like. They're open in the daytime. They do provide a landing platform most of the time. Um, and most of the time their flowers are actually bilaterally symmetrical. So um, when you look at something, they look the same on both sides. And then flowers are tubule, um, usually with nectar at the base of the tube. There are certain um, flowers like a snapdragon is like perfect because only a certain weight and a type of bee can push that pe flower petal down. And then for them to get in there, um, certain bees that are smaller, if they have the weight, they can get in there, but they get stuck and they die. Um, so a lot of the times it's the, the bees that have to be a perfect size and a perfect weight to not only trigger to open the flower to get that nectar, but then also to get out as well. And if we think about it, it's a great um, adaptation for that plant too. So if you get um, an animal in there that you don't want in there, it's basically saying, hey, I don't want you. You're not the kind of pollinator that I want. You get trapped and you die. And then they learn from that. Over time, they don't want to do that anymore. 
Um, why are bees so efficient when we talk about pollination? Um, they do this thing called buzz pollination. So you might have heard of it before, um, but some flowers are very conservative when it comes to giving up their pollen. Uh, we wouldn't think so because we they want it to be out in the world and they want to produce new offspring and pass on their genetic material, but Pollen's expensive to make. So for that flower, when I talk about expensive, it takes a lot of energy to produce that pollen and they don't want to just give it up willy nilly. They want it to be to the right pollinator and they want it to be used efficiently. So a lot of the times they, um, they kind of hold their pollen in. So it has to be a special insect that can release that pollen. Most insects are basically unable to access this and they know that and they don't visit certain types of flowers. Bees have a special strategy where they will produce um, a slight electrical current and they buzz and it releases this pollen from this anther, um, this vibration, and it drops all the pollen and then the bees can get all of it. And then again, it sticks to them. So it's a good reproductive strategy. Um, they really like this and it's good for the plant. Um, and it's also good for the, the bee as well. Um, so the the pollen is basically packed so tightly in there. The bees have to vibrate it to release that pollen, and then they can get the nectar and the nutritional value, and then the flower can release that pollen as well. Um, blueberries, tomatoes, kiwis are actually um, three really good examples that only can be pollinated by bees, and they require this buzz pollination to get that pollen off. All right, beetles. Um, when we talk about uh, different types of pollinators, people always forget about beetles, but they were one of the first insects to visit flowers way back then, and they still remain a very essential pollinator today. So um, when we talk about beetles, the fossil record actually shows beetles. There were tons of them during the Mesozoic era, which is about 200 million years ago, um, but they were the earliest visitors of what we call angiosperm. So those kind of first flowering plants, um, they're the ones that were able to pollinate those. Um, beetles are kind of messy though. <laughs> they have this strategy. Um, it's called mess and soil pollinators. It's kind of their nickname. Um, so they will eat their way actually through the petals. Um, um, and then they get their pollen and then they will defecate in that area and then they'll leave. So um, they do this so that other beetles and other animals don't pollinate their flowers. Um, but they're especially important for these ancient species. Have you ever heard of a magnolia or a spice bush? They're only pollinated by beetles, by certain types of beetles. And then beetles have insane vision. They can see color. We believe that they can see color. Um, so they will pollinate certain types of flowers that other animals will not touch. All right, so what's a beetle flower going to look like? They're going to be bowl shaped. Um, they're going to be white or kind of a dull and green color. They're going to smell strongly fruity. They're open during the day. Um, they're moderate nectar producers. They're not huge animals, so they don't eat a ton of nectar like a bat. Um, they could be solitary flowers, kind of just one at a time, not those clusters, or they could be clustered too. So beetles, we kind of found that they're not as picky as certain other types of pollinators. All right, moths. So we talk about butterflies. Um, well, bats and moths kind of take over the night shift when we talk about pollination. These are all the flowers that are nocturnal and they come out at nighttime. So um, a lot of them will hover. A lot of them will land. One of my favorite is the hawk moth or the sphinx moth is this um, one that I have in the picture here. So a lot of people, when they see it, it looks like a hummingbird. It's very small. It hovers like a hummingbird. It moves like a hummingbird. It's actually a moth, which is cool. Um, but these guys can go and visit certain types of flowers that a lot of other moths will not touch. Um, they have this very long proboscis, like a butterfly. They will roll it up and they will stick that down into those tubular flowers, grab that nectar and be on their way. So um, these guys have a tongue that's actually longer than their body so that they can get right in there to those tubular flowers and get that nectar. Uh, we do have to remember too that not all moths are nocturnal. There are some that will be out during the daytime and those flowers are very important as well. Um, so what do flowers look like that moths are going to visit? They're typically in clusters. They provide a landing platform. Uh, they're out at nighttime, so they don't really care about the color, but they're going to look for dull colors or kind of a white color in flowers. They're open in the late afternoon or the nighttime. 
And there's ample nectar producers. Um, so these are going to be things like morning glory, tobacco plants, yucca, gardenias. Um, in Nebraska, we have the yucca moth and there's certain species of yucca and every species of yucca has a certain species of moth that will pollinate it. And that is it. Um, so it's kind of a very cool relationship. So if one of those plants goes, that whole species will go because it's nothing to pollinate. And same vice versa. If something happens to the pollinator, the plant's in trouble. If something happens to the plant, the pollinator's in trouble. So it's a very, very intimate, close relationship that those species have with each other. All right, so those are the pollinators in Nebraska. Um, there are some that I didn't talk about. There's wasps, there's flies. Um, we only have so much time. So I really want to quick kind of point out what are some of the other global pollinators when we look at this, because there's some that um, we might not think about. Um, so one of the unusual and the largest pollinator in the world is the black and white ruffed lemur. So these guys are only found on the small little island off the coast of Africa called Madagascar. Um, so these guys, they're the main pollinators of what's called the traveler's tree or the traveler's palm. So these guys, if you ever look at their fingers, they look like little human hands. So they're primates. Um, they're related to us very distantly, but still related. Um, they use nimble hands and basically they have to open these um, petals and this bracts is what they're called on a flower. And then the only ones that have these tiny little fingers that can do so, no other creature can do this. And then they have these really long snouts and the tongues that they stick inside the tree's flower. They grab that nectar. Again, they're not trying to pollinate. They're just trying to get their food. And in the process, they have all this dusting of pollen on their face. And then when they go to another flower, they release that pollen into the flower. So they're very important. Um, these trees are huge. They're usually about 40 feet high. So they're great for reaching those. Um, but again, they collect their pollen on their face. Um, no other creature has the ability to pollinate this plant. So it's very important, these guys. Um, and again, they're only found on one little place naturally. Um, so the, it's even more important for those plants that are found on that island. All right, we're taking a trip to Australia. So there's something called a honey possum, which are these cute little guys. They're marsupials, but they pollinate something called the eucalyptus tree, um, which a lot of us I'm sure have heard of, and then the banksia tree. Um, these are flowers, and so they're the ones that pollinate them. They have these grasping feet and a prehensile tail, so it, it's able to hold and to curl onto things like a hand, um, and it allows it to hang from the branches in the tree as it searches for flowers. So um, they have a very long tongue. They have a pointed snout, and they're able to grab into that pollen um, and get the nectar and then move on to another plant. Um, a lot of Australian marsupials, these tiny little mammals, they are very important pollinators. If you've ever heard of a bush baby or a sugar glider, they're also actually very important pollinators as well. All right, and then we also have our reptiles. So a lot of people don't think about reptiles as pollinators and they're not as efficient by any means as a bee or a butterfly, but they still do pollinate. So geckos, lizards, skinks, a lot of them are nectivores, um, only eating nectar, or some of them are omnivores. They eat fruits and vegetables. Um, there's the skink that's in Brazil. And it drinks the nectar that's found in the flowers of this special tree, the Malungu tree. Um, and they're the only ones that will um, get that nectar. And again, their scales are really rough. So that pollen sticks to their scales. And when they move on to another plant, they in the hopes that they will drop off some of that pollen onto another plant. Um, have you ever heard of the flax flower? Um, there's one in New Zealand. There's a special gecko that will pollinate that. So we can't forget about our reptiles. All right, so really quick, how can you help? We've talked, we've heard about pollinators are in trouble. We've talked about bees. There's a lot of diseases. There's um, hive collapse. There's a lot of pesticides that people will use. Um, people don't really understand the importance of pollinators. So what can you do to help them? Um, you can plant for pollinators. That is the number one thing that you can do. When we talk about planting flowers, we want you to plant native flowers to your area. So if you live in California, your um, flowers that you're going to plant are going to be very different than the flowers that we're going to plant here in Nebraska. So um, visit your local extension office. We are a local nursery out there and figure out the soil type that you have, what flowers are going to work best, and then create a habitat of opportunity. So this is going to be an area not only for them to eat, but also to have a nesting area or someplace to go in the wintertime. 
Um, reducing or eliminating pesticides is also, again, a really good thing. Um, it really hurts our pollinators and it also seeps into the ground and can get into our groundwater. Um, register as a bee-friendly garden. So once you have your garden up and running, there's actually a certification that you can get nationally that's called a bee-friendly garden, um, just meaning that your bee is friendly or your garden is friendly for bees and other types of pollinators. Um, you can also educate others. So tell people about pollinators and why they're important. Um, um, my favorite thing to talk about pollinator pollination with people is I'm like, do you like to eat? And most people, most people, like 99.9999% of people like to eat. And so I'm like, well, thank a pollinator because one in three bites of food that you eat is pollinated by a pollinator. So um, educate people about how important pollinators are. And it's actually pretty easy to have a pollinator garden. Um, leave the dandelions, get some native plants and plant them in hopes that the pollinators will come. Um, support local pollinators and different organizations. So here in Nebraska, we have the UNL Bee Lab. Um, Judy Woosmart is the one that runs that, and she is a plethora of information. She has a lot of information about how to start a hive, like raising bees and not honeybees, but raising different types of bees um, and how to do that. It's fairly easy. She does a lot of classes for people on how to make bee-friendly gardens and po plant for pollinators. So check out your local pollinator um, organizations and then conserve all your resources. So it's not just planting native, but it's protecting the ground, it's protecting the water, it's protecting all of our natural resources. And then support groups that promote those science-based efforts for pollinators. So the Rossi Game Parks, um, a place that is really um, like your state wildlife agency or your NRD or your DNR, wherever you are, someone that um, knows what they're doing and can back up their information with those science-based efforts for those pollinators. So all right, so that was a lot. We had a ton of information. I know we went really fast today. Um, next week, we're going to meet, we're going to talk about aquatic plants. So we'll talk a little bit about that water, that hydrophily that we talked earlier about, that pollen that floats in the water. Um, we're going to talk about our aquatic plants here in Nebraska, and then also a little bit about invasive plants as well. And then we're going to head to mountain lions. we got some animal communication, and then we're going to end the season on clouds on July 20th. All right, so if you want more, we have a YouTube channel, educational YouTube channel. You can find all of our science subs on there. There's a lot of different types of educational videos. We have our nature nerd nights that we did, nature journaling. There's a lot of just free stuff that you can look at on there. We have an educational Facebook page. We have an educational Instagram page. We have just our free downloadable website, Nebraska Wildlife Education. Um, so there's a lot of good resources, free downloadable things that you can have. Um, so that's what I have for all of you. Um, I will tell you that everyone that registered, whether you were here today or not, you will receive an email me, from me tomorrow. It will give some really good resources. So some of the stuff that we talked about, some of the organizations we talked about, um, some of this information I can give you a really good graphic of all those pollinator syndromes. So those different types of flowers to attract different types of pollinators. Um, so I'll give you a lot of good resources. We also have an educational evaluation. If you fill that out, it helps us make our programs better. And if you would like to see a science of on something, I'm always looking for ideas. So please help me out with that. And if you actually fill that out, I will give you some swag. So thank you. We appreciate it. Um, I think we maybe, again, it always worries me when I don't have any questions because I, I confuse people that I uh, overload you with information. But um, I appreciate everyone for coming today. And like I mentioned, you'll get that email from me. And hopefully we see you all next week for aquatic plants. So thanks, everyone. Um, I hope you have a great week and we will see you next Thursday. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.